Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. My name is Kitty and I'm an academic junior doctor working in the UK. Today we'll be continuing to talk about the interview for the Academic Foundation program, focusing particularly on the academic critical appraisal station and how to prepare for it. This video is aimed at final year medical students who are applying or have already applied to the Academic Foundation program. And if you don't know what that is, you can check out this other video on my channel where I explain what is the AFP and should you apply for it. In this video, we'll first briefly recap the AFP interview structure. We'll then go through what to expect from the academic portion of the AFP interview, from what you might be asked to critically appraise, structuring your answer, and the key high yield pieces of information that you need to learn before your interview. I'll demonstrate an example critical appraisal answer. And finally, I'll share some personal top tips preparing for the academic station of the AFP interview and any other resources that you might find useful as well. Firstly, let's quickly recap what the AFP interview format is generally like. If you have already seen my last video on the clinical portion of the AFP interview, Interview, then you can skip ahead to the next section. This will differ depending on which deanery you have applied for, but mainly they will be split into three different stations. The personal CV and career aspirations, clinical management, and academic critical appraisal. Some deaneries may not have a personal question station, and others may negate the academic critical appraisal station if, for example, you're applying for an education or leadership AFP post. The length of the interview will also differ depending on where you apply. Some places will do a 20-minute panel interview comprising of all three stations, whilst others will do three separate 15-minute OSCE-like stations if you will. The amount of preparation time you're given will also differ. For this reason, it is really important that you find out what the structure of the interview may be like as early as possible. This information may be available online, by word of mouth from previous year's applicants. Or you can also try and get in contact with the program director of your preferred AFP deanery and see if they can give you any information in advance. So what is the academic part of the AFP interview? The academic station in the AFP interview is designed to test your understanding of research methodologies, appreciation of evidence-based medicine, and be able to critically analyse the results that you are given. A good academic should be able to discern if the evidence provided is reliable and critique the study design to determine the presence of any biases, and determine whether the study results are sufficient and reliable enough to change clinical practice. This process is called critical appraisal and is defined as the process of carefully and systematically examining research to judge its trustworthiness and its value and relevance in a particular context. So what might you be asked to critically appraise? At the interview, you may be asked to critically appraise a paper that you've read and prepared beforehand or material that is given to you on the day. If it's the latter, you will typically have 5-10 to 10 minutes to read the material before going into the interview. What you're asked to read might be a research abstract, it might be a full paper with some sections removed, they might just describe a certain study, and you could get data tables which you need to interpret. In terms of structuring your answers, when you're asked to critically appraise a study, you're often asked to summarise it first. The interviewers may then follow up with prompts or specific questions about specific parts of the paper. In general, you're expected to be concise when talking about a paper, but if you're able to recognise some weaknesses or strengths without prompting, then you might score better than a candidate who did require those prompts. In terms of structuring the answer, most candidates will have formulated their own structure for critical appraisal, and you'll find a way that works for you. Personally, the structure I used was first stating the type of study, so if it's a randomised trial or a cohort study, mentioning any publication-related factors such as whether it was published in a peer-reviewed journal of a high impact factor, and whether there was any company sponsors and competing interests. I then described the study using the PICO format with population, intervention, control and outcomes. Then I would summarise the main findings of this study, taking care not to get too concerned with specific numbers or specific statistical methods that they're using at this point. I would then list some strengths and weaknesses of the study, commenting on both the study design and the methodology, and any potential biases that may have arisen from the way that the study was conducted. You should aim to cover some broad strengths and weaknesses of the type of study used, and then go into the specific weaknesses that are particularly relevant to this particular study. Then, you should look at the study results and comment on whether they are valid and reliable. Then finally, conclude whether the paper would change your clinical practice, why and why not. So that's an example structure of how I would answer a critical appraisal question. But before you can do that, there are a few key things about research that you need to learn. And as those of you with research experience will undoubtedly know, there's simply too much knowledge with research and statistics to teach you all of it in this video. So I'm just going to broadly cover the main topics that you need to know for the interview, and then you'll have to go do a fair bit of background reading yourself to really learn all of this. 
So firstly, the types of studies. So whilst randomized controlled trials are really popular choices for the AFP interviews, you also need to know about the different types of non-randomized study designs and what are their characteristics. The common types of study that might come up are systematic reviews, randomized trials, cohort studies, case control studies, and other types of ecological studies and case series. For each type of study, you need to learn what it is and what types of questions it can answer, for example, establishing a causational or temporal relationship, the strength of evidence that they provide in the hierarchy of evidence, how they're conducted in a broad sense, so for example, in a case control study, how do they identify the cases and how do they identify the controls? And lastly, the advantages and disadvantages of each study design. As we discussed earlier in the components of the critical appraisal, you'll almost always be asked to discuss the strengths and weaknesses of a study. So if you're able to ramble off some generic strengths and weaknesses of the study first, then you can buy yourself some time to think about the specific limitations of that study that you're reading. Biases is the next big component that you need to learn and know off the back of your hand. Systematic bias is defined as anything which impacts the study results in a non-random way, thus questioning the validity of the results and therefore the study itself. This is also known as the internal validity of a study. Now there are many sources of biases to consider, but the main ones that you should address, especially in a randomized controlled trial, is selection bias, performance bias, observational bias, attrition bias, and confounding. I'm not going to define the different types of biases in this short video because that would make this video far too long, but it's really important that you read up on this in your own time and make sure you understand each type of biases and how they can be reduced exactly. When you discuss bias in the interview as well, make sure that you're as specific as possible. So don't just say, oh, the study is sufficiently randomized so it reduces bias. Instead, say something like, the double blinding in this trial has reduced performance and detection bias. This will make you sound a lot more knowledgeable and the interviewers will be confident that you actually know what you're talking about. Knowing your basic statistical terms is also really important for the academic critical appraisal. Whilst you may not need to know exactly how to use statistical software or really niche, complicated statistical calculations, you need to know enough of basic statistics so that you'll be able to interpret results and whether they're significant or not. You need to understand some key terms like power calculation, hazard ratios, p-values, and 95% confidence intervals, as well as common methods of statistical analysis such as the t-test, the Fisher's exact test, the chi-square test, and Kaplan-Meier analysis, etc, etc. You also need to know about statistical errors such as type 1 and type 2 errors. Again, this is a very non-exhaustive list in the wide, wide world of statistical analysis, and it really depends on your own background reading to understand these terms. Use a simple statistic book that is easy to understand and read, and try and learn these definitions. You need to be very comfortable interpreting results, especially with regards to the p-value and the confidence interval. Again, in the interview, you're going to be really time pressured, so you don't have the time to think about what a 95 confidence interval is and what they mean. You just have to look at it at a glance and know if it's significant or not. Another key part of a critical appraisal is assessing the clinical relevance of a study. You should always link your critical appraisal to whether it will change your clinical practice. The two things to consider here is one, the internal validity, which is what we just talked about in terms of the study design and whether there are any biases that makes the study results unreliable, and the external validity of the study, i.e. whether it is actually going to be applicable to the clinical population that you're dealing with. For the former, the answer is probably always no, because they're going to pick studies where you can find weaknesses that you will want to comment on, and also according to the hierarchy of evidence, only a systematic review and meta-analysis with a strong methodology is ever going to be enough to actually change your practice, and everything else should not be able to convince you at all as a single study. For external validity, consider whether the patient cohort that is used in the study is actually reasonable. Are they too focused in a certain area of the world and therefore is not applicable to the UK or worldwide? Are there any particular inclusion and exclusion criteria used that would mean that actually this is not really applicable to the clinical population? that you see on a day-to-day -day basis. And finally, you may be asked to consider the research ethics when thinking about the design of the study and how you can conduct ethical research. You can integrate this when discussing the weaknesses of a study, for example, if it was company-sponsored, did they try to mask any insignificant results so they can try and sell their device or their drug better? And then you need to address how you would ideally design this study to eliminate this ethical dilemma, for example, through the proper channels of NHL-funded research. This was a double-blinded randomized control trial, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, so it's a high-impact factor peer-reviewed journal. It is a company-sponsored trial by Bayer and Janssen Pharmaceuticals. The study involved patients with peripheral arterial disease who had already undergone revascularization, and compares rivaroxaban plus aspirin compared to aspirin alone with a placebo. 
The primary efficacy outcome was a composite outcome of acute limb ischemia, major amputation, myocardial infarction, ischemic stroke, and death. The principal safety outcome was major bleeding according to the TIMI as well as the ISTH classification. The main findings of the study was that with Roxaban plus aspirin had a significantly lower incidence of the occurrence of primary composite outcome compared to aspirin alone. There is however increased risk of bleeding defined by the ISTH criteria in the Rivroxaban plus aspirin group compared to the aspirin alone group. However, there is no significant difference when using the TIMI major bleeding criteria. In terms of the strengths of the study, it is first and foremost a randomized controlled trial. Therefore, it confers a higher level of evidence and we are able to determine causality. The randomization process of the trial reduces selection bias and reduces confounding as well. It is a double-blinded trial with a placebo which is the gold standard, so that reduces performance and detection bias. According to the power calculation in the methods, the study is also adequately powered to test the primary hypothesis. They also use intention to treat analysis to reflect the real-world efficacy of rifaroxaban. There are a few major weaknesses in this study. Firstly, it is a company-sponsored trial by Bayer and Janssen Pharmaceuticals, which may indicate competing interests when reporting the study results. There are a few major limitations in the methodology used as well, including the use of composite outcome as a primary endpoint. Although this increases the power of the trial, it makes it harder to interpret the results as we cannot discern the effect of the treatment on all the outcomes, and it also assumes that all of these outcomes under the composite measure have equal weighting. In fact, when we look at the data table, although the hazard ratio for the primary efficacy outcome is significant with a 95% confidence interval that does not cross the value of 1 and the p-value that is less than 0 0.05, however, looking at the individual components that make up the primary efficacy outcome, only acute limb ischemia has a 95% confidence interval that does not cross the value of 1, which means it is significant, whilst the rest, including major amputation, myocardial infarction, stroke and death, all have a 95% confidence interval that crosses 1, indicating that the hazard ratio is not actually significant. This prompts a problem especially with research ethics because the composite outcome appears to suggest that with Roxaban plus aspirin reduces the risk of all of these factors, however in reality only acute limb ischemia is reduced. This is especially significant in a company-sponsored trial as they can use the composite outcome to infer that with Roxaban is a better drug that affects all of these endpoints when it is not true, particularly in the setting of trying to sell the drug. Another major methodological weakness is the use of multiple definitions for major bleeding, uh, using the TIMI criteria as well as the ISTH criteria. Whilst I'm unsure what the difference is between these two criteria, using two different definitions might mean that there are actually differences in the way that bleeding is categorised in these criteria, especially given that one of these is significant and the other one is not, I'm suspecting that there might be a difference in major and minor bleeding, and I would need to read the full paper as well as read up on the definition of these criteria to make a judgement on what this means. In the methodology of this study, they also mentioned that they did an exploratory analysis of the efficacy outcomes. This is fishing for significant results and therefore can increase type 1 error as well. Finally, another major weakness of this study is the significant loss to follow up and attrition bias that is present. Over a third of the patients in this study has discontinued treatment prematurely and therefore calls into question the internal validity of the study as patients may have withdrawn because of the side effects of the drug. However, the loss to follow-up was fairly balanced between the two intervention arms in this study, so it might just be a reflection of the high mortality of this particular patient cohort. In this case, we know that they have peripheral arterial disease and they're likely to have other comorbidities and a shorter life expectancy in general. I will need to have a look at the full consort diagram in the study, if available, to discern if there's any particular differences in the reason for withdrawing from the study. Overall, based on this single randomised control trial, it is unlikely to alter my practice, especially given the weaknesses that we've identified that questions its internal validity. I would also need to examine the external validity of the study by looking at how they have selected these patients. I would probably need a higher level of evidence in the form of a systematic review or meta-analysis of multiple randomised controlled trials in order to change my clinical practice. Another reason why this would not change my clinical practice is that rifaroxaban and aspirin are not the only antiplatelet and anticoagulant agents that are used in real life. Other agents like clopidogrel, ticagrelol and other doax or warfarin may also be used, so therefore this cannot be applied to a wide range of practice. 
The study could also have benefited from a hazard analysis to see if the beneficial outcomes outweigh the harmful ones in terms of the number needed to treat and number needed to harm. So my experience with the academic station was that it was one of the harder ones to prepare for in the AFP interview. And this is mainly because in most medical school curriculums, you don't really get a lot of teaching on research methodology and also how to critically appraise a paper. So I remember that I had to do a fair amount of background reading on my own, even though I already had a strong research background. And unfortunately, there is really no one resource that is going to answer all your questions, and you're just going to have to read around online and using different resources to compile your own method of doing a critical appraisal. So let's talk about some of the useful reading resources that I found helpful when I was preparing for my interview. Just a quick disclaimer that we're not sponsored or affiliated in any way with any of these at all. So firstly, there is this ebook I used by Codex, which is called Critical Appraisal for the Academic Foundation Program. It is £2, so it's super cheap, and it's also a really concise way to start looking into critical appraisal. In this ebook, they summarise the key components that we talked about, including some advantages and disadvantages of different study types, definitions for certain research terms and what they mean, the main biases that you need to consider and how can you look for them, and a word example. I think broadly, this ebook covers the need to know knowledge that you need to have for the interview, but I think that actually you need to do quite a bit of background reading beyond this to actually have an in-depth understanding and make sure you can actually apply this to any paper that you read. So it's a good starting point, but you'll need more. Next is the Cochrane Risk of Bias tool or the ROB2. This was developed by the Cochrane Collaboration, which I'm sure most of you know is the main body that produces really high quality systematic reviews on most topics you can find in medicine. And it's a standardized tool that is used to assess different sources of biases in randomized trials and also non-randomized studies. Most high quality systematic reviews that you read will use this tool. This tool is completely free and available on the interwebs. It covers all of the major biases that you need to know about and how you can assess for them. It's probably in a bit more detail than you would actually need at this stage, but it's a very comprehensive tool. If you have the time, you can skim through the full guidance document that they have on their website, or if you're pressed for time, you can just go through the crib sheet. They also have a very template for you to assess risk as you go along reading a randomized trial, and it's literally just a tick box of did they say this, did they say this, did they say this, yes, no, yes, therefore high or unclear risk of bias. I remember that I was in a really lucky position where about three, four months before my AFP interview, so at the end of summer, I was involved in a systematic review project where I had to assess the risk of bias for about 94 different randomized trials. This took me quite a long time, I think it was about a week and a half that I spent just looking at these trials every day, but at the end of it I got really used to using the ROB tool, and actually that process of reading through so many papers and getting really used to identifying bias made me really proficient at identifying the key trigger words and trigger phrases that address those biases. So by the time I got to the AFP interview, I was very comfortable looking for these key phrases that would indicate whether a study was at high or low risk at certain types of biases. And finally, there's this website called CASP, which is again free, and they have critical appraisal checklists for literally almost every type of study that you can come across. And in each PDF checklist, they've basically got the very high yield components of a critical appraisal and the main questions that you need to answer when looking at these studies. So again, it's really useful if you can go and find some papers to read and then use these checklists to help you look for the main limitations and weaknesses. So in summary, the academic component of the AFB interview will require you to critically appraise literature. You should develop a systematic approach to structuring your answer and be able to summarize the study, identify any major biases in the study design, comment on the validity of the results, and consider the clinical relevance of the research. And that's the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you found this useful when preparing for your AFB interviews. I also have other videos on my channel covering the clinical and personal parts of the AFB interview, so make sure you check those out as well. Don't forget to drop a like on this video and subscribe to the channel so that you can get notified when future videos come out. That's it for now and see you next time.